All right, so tonight we're very excited uh, to have Jennifer Bay Williams uh, present to us and talk with us um, about fluency. We purposely left it wide open, um, the term fluency, um, and let Jenny do what she does so wonderfully. And uh, we are really excited to have her here. So I know that you're going to um, just be enlightened about strategies and, and ways to um, work with your students on fluency. So Jennifer Bay Williams, she is a mathematics educator. She's at University of Louisville. She's an author. She is. Um, she has a series of books on fluency, and um, I believe there's another one uh, forthcoming soon for middle school teachers. She has also continued the wonderful work of John Vandewall in the Teaching Student-Centered Mathematics series. She's a speaker. She is a researcher. She is just busy. She's dynamic. She's a wonderful person. She's one of our favorites. And when you look at all of these, you're probably thinking, well, what does Jennifer Bay Williams do on vacation? <laughs> well, I think sometimes she does webinars <laughs> on her vacation. So we are really excited to have you here tonight, Jennifer. I am going to stop sharing and I am going to let you do your thing and stay out of your way. Welcome, everyone. I really am uh, honored to have you here tonight. And um, what do I do on vacation? Well, I met with Mark and Ryan about this presentation, this vacation, but I also did paddleboard yoga for the first time. So that was pretty fun. Um, I just got back. And uh, so I'm happy to share about fluency. I laughed about the simple title. Um, I really care about fluency. I was a teacher um, who and a teacher educator who used to say, well, we got the skills down. We just don't have the conceptual understanding. And then I started really paying attention to what students were doing and seeing them overuse the standard algorithm when they didn't need it and just overlook opportunities to, you know, use shortcuts and things like that. And I realized that that statement wasn't accurate, that they have the skills. Our um, students and our teachers, we all need to be more, um, a, more flexible in our thinking. So I have focused probably the last 10 years, maybe 15 years on helping people see what real fluency is, what it looks like. And so i um, super happy to talk about it whenever I can. I'm going to call it my PowerPoint. And I'm also entering in the um, chat a link to a Google folder. And it has the activities that we're doing, including the code numbers that are also in the slide deck as you see them. And when uh, you notice that something isn't in the folder that you wish it was, then, you know, at the end, uh, you know, please share with me what you wish was in the folder, um, including my slides. I'll add my slides when I'm done. I'm never sure how many I'll get through. So I usually post those after the fact. So um, with no further ado, um, Here is my expanded title. Uh, tonight, uh, around the huge world of fluency, sorry, I got this late. I, I really, um, sun came in after we already got logged in. I'm just gonna turn my seat sideways. Um, in the whole world of big fluency topics to think about, one of the things I think is important is the investment of time with basic fact strategies instead of memorizing them. And I've done many sessions on this and I have a little, little purple book about it, um, but I wanna focus tonight on why, how that investment pays off. Although I'm not using the financial uh, <laughs> metaphor, I'm using the tree growing metaphor. So that is what we're gonna work on tonight. I wanna start with subtraction. I'm gonna bookend today's talk with subtraction. So to begin, if you would just solve these two problems any way you like, you do not need to enter anything in the chat. You can put it on a post-it off to the side, whatever you like, and I'll be quiet for a little bit for you to think through solving those problems.
now that you've had a moment to think about it with uh, no uh, request for visuals, we are going to go to our first code. We're going to go to, um, this is the code. You can see it here. Um, and it's also on your code sheet that's in the Google Drive. And perhaps Mark can enter it in the chat for me. Um, and what I would like for you to do is I would like for you to um, create your own number line, either using the features on the left toolbar or just um, using one of the pens and illustrate each one of these problems on the number line. So when you get the share code, you'll have a number line that I just went ahead and set up for you. Mark or Ryan, do you wanna jump in with um, how to enter the share code? Sure, um, can I just, I have the screen just for a bit. Oh, there we go. So once you are logged in, bear with me here, I'm still in my PowerPoint. Once you're logged in, you should see this screen. You can enter that share code right in here and then click go. And that'll take you to uh, the work that Jennifer prepared for us. Oh, of course. All right, um, because we only have, you know, like about 45 minutes left. Um, I know if you've tooled around here, great. If not, I am, it's no loss because I've created possible visuals you might have created. So for nine, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna launch back in. So if you um, wanna keep um, manipulating uh, on the number line, you're welcome to, but I'm moving on. So you're welcome to just stop what you're doing and come back uh, and participate in the discussion. All right, so here is how you might have illustrated nine and one fourth minus one and one half. And I'm gonna go to uh, the next one, or did anyone um, enter into the chat? I'll ask you that. Um, enter into the chat if there is a different way that you showed this problem on the number line, just use words. Oh, you use the bars. Thank you, Tammy. Yeah, I use the arrows, but in the tool, you can use the bars to just count along vertically um, or the number lines, the straight lines. All three are um, possibilities. Haha. -ha. So Jill actually subtracted the whole numbers first and then subtracted the fractions. I love it. 
So you jump down by halves, another way to jump down. Nice. All right, let's go to the next problem, this problem. So we're gonna do a rapid fire chat uh, here. I'm gonna show one way to do it. And um, you're going to say, if you solved it in a way almost like that, like you might've used the straight arrows instead of the loops or whatever, let's call that the same, um, just a different way to visualize it. But in terms of the numbers that were used, if you did it like the picture you see, then just type in the chat, that's me. So you can go ahead and type in the chat, that's me. So then when it's time, when you see yours, you just hit submit. Are you ready? Here's the first possibility for this problem. You started at six and a half, you took away the parts first, then the whole. If that's you, type in, that's me. We have a couple hundred people on the line, so we'll get a little bit of a feel for how common this approach was. Oh, me. Yeah. You don't even need to write in that. You can just put me. Yep. That's me. Perfect. I love it. And we can be multilingual. Feel free to use a different language. All right. How about this one? saying lots and lots of me's. And how about this one? Subtracted the whole number first and then the fraction. Uh, and I'm seeing just a whole bunch of that's me flying by. All right, here we go. I'm gonna switch to the next screen here. Oh, subtracted five and a half, right. Okay, so Heather, what a great transition. Here comes the next one. Counted, started with five and a half and then counted up. Counted up, beautiful, beautiful. We have some math savvy folks here. So, um, I'm going to share a little story here. And like I said, I'm bookending it here. But in my experience in working with children and with uh, math specialists, uh, elementary math specialists specifically, I see the ones counting back far more frequently than I see the counting up. And if you think about what they mean conceptually is these are all thinking about taking away five and three fourths. And when you think about um, counting up, you're really thinking about what is the difference between these? I'm comparing them or I'm seeing how many more, it's difference. So with subtraction, we have this opportunity to think about it as takeaway and think about it as find the difference. And the tools um, in Braining Camp are so helpful to see where students are, are thinking. Um, and like I said, because I see an overuse of find the difference or takeaway and not enough find the difference. And then that for me is a way to think, oh, I need to work more on this idea of compare, find the difference um, through the stories that we're telling, through the activities that we're doing and through the models that I'm bringing to, um, to students um, so that they make good choices. With this problem right here, noticing that those numbers are close together and just finding the difference is a very efficient way to solve that problem. And that's our goal with fluency is to find an efficient way to solve problems. All right, so um, that takes me to the focus tonight. Fluency efforts must ensure that every student has access to a range of strategies and have regular opportunities to choose among those strategies. So um, I'm going to take us through this um, idea starting with basic facts so that we get a solid beginning with our basic facts, a good beginning, and then we build on that beginning through um, other, um, through bigger numbers, other numbers. I'll just say other numbers because some of them are smaller numbers. All right. So at this point, people oftentimes say, I don't have time to teach all these strategies. 
or what are all the strategies that I should focus on? And there really aren't that many. So to begin with addition, uh, and I've shared this slide literally hundreds of times, there's really three reasoning strategies that go with the facts for addition. Um, at least they cluster around these three. And that is your near doubles group, the making 10 where you take some from one number and move it over to another to make 10, or the use 10, I call it pretend to 10, where you just pretend one of the two numbers is a 10 and then adjust. Um, this grows into compensation. So um, that is, those are the three reasoning strategies. And with multiplication, similarly, there's not that many strategies. There's this idea of doubling, adding on a group or two groups, um, subtracting a group, and then um, near squares, which is basically adding a group or subtracting a group, depending on which square you're using. And all of these are really break apart strategies. So really you have this notion of doubling and adding or subtracting a group as strategies at the very beginning with basic facts. Then as we get to two digit numbers, fractions, decimals, what might seem like a whole bunch of different strategies isn't because they all house themselves around these, what um, John San Giovanni and I call the significant strategies because they have long lives. They're useful with lots of different kinds of numbers and they are useful frequently. And so, for example, counting on or counting back, which is what we did on the number line. If you're doing counting up, counting back, the number line serves you well. Um, we have the make tens that starts with making 10 and then moves to making tens and then grows on beyond that, which is something we're going to be working on tonight. Then we've got, you know, using partials, breaking apart. We saw that also on the number line where um, you looked at the whole numbers first and then you looked at the fractions. Um, the break apart to multiply, have and double, which is basically another way to break apart, but it's break apart by factors instead of breaking apart into two add-ins. And then compensation is so useful across the board, across three of the four operations anyways. And then um, using, you know, for subtraction, using think addition and for division using think multiplication. So those are, those are the biggies and they might have different names, but um, these are particularly useful again, because they work across numbers. So let's see how that works. Well, for us to be able to, again, raise fluent students, the beginning is having them feel comfortable with the strategies. So we first teach them to use a strategy. I find that focused strategy instruction is critical to their eventual fluency where they're choosing the strategies. So what does that look like? Well, for make 10, we're gonna, we're gonna see how make 10 grows. That's what we're gonna do. So for make 10, how do we help that be visible to students? Well, we go back to um, what is most concrete, and that is, uh, is the screen black for you all? No, you can see it, thanks. <laughs> whew, whew. <laughs> without my visuals, I'll be lost. <laughs> it's hard to highlight the Brain and Camp tools without the visuals. All right, thanks you all. All right, so make, so make 10, uh, begins with basic facts. And so what does it look like with visuals? Well, what I like to, um, I think what's really useful for students is to give a known fact and then get to the strategy that you're working on. So one way to do that is pairing your quick looks. So we'll do a quick look routine like this, where, you know, you flash it, it goes away, you flash it a second time, goes away, you flash it a third time, how many do you see? And the students will say 16, because they've already, if I'm working on making 10, I've already made sure that they know that they are automatic with these um, things that lead into make 10. They already know their combos of 10, and they already know their 10 and some more facts. So with that in mind, I'm anticipating that they, they see this right away. It's 16, it's 10 and 6, 16. All right, great. Here's the next one. I hold up. First look, second look, and third look. And what do you see and how do you see it? And what students will say is one of two things. They'll say, I moved one over and I'll say, oh, you used a making 10 strategy. Yes, you made a 10. Um, or they'll say, well, I just pretended it was 10. I got 16 and I took one away, or I just knew that the last one was 16, so I took one away. 
oh, so you pretended it was a 10 and adjusted. Good job. And then we just do that with other images. So here would be uh, the beginning of one pair, and here's the second one of the pair. And you can see um, that once you make these, and uh, I made all of these in Branding Camp, I always do, not just for this workshop. Uh, they're super simple, it's super versatile. Um, and then here's the pairing. So what it looks like in construction is something like this. I create the two, I do little, uh, you know, I grab the screen and then I paste it into my slides. And then I oftentimes go old school because I'll visit schools and I don't know which one, I don't know if the students are gonna, how many we're gonna do or which ones we're gonna do. So I print them off. So this is how this works. Um, you now have a code to go in and explore this, make some for yourself, get ready to teach make 10 or pretend to 10 with your students. And as you're doing that, um, uh, notice that the tool, the 10 frame in on the little gray part of the screen is uh, in the tan part is horizontal. And I'm really sorry about the sun here. I'm going to move my seat while you all are working. Um, I like to turn those slides vertical or the 10 frames vertical and braining camp. Um, um, one of the things when you uh, hover above it, you can see how to rotate the 10 frame um, to a vertical orientation. Um, and I do this when I'm thinking about my equation being horizontal, nine plus six, that I feel like I can almost just see a nine plus six as a horizontal equation. And then when I'm doing vertical equations, I, I go back to the, the, long, um, the long style of the 10 frame. So that's been my preference. Um, but I feel like it parallels the equations better. Yes, thank you. All right, I'm gonna pause here for a few moments so you have a chance to explore these tools. And I'm going to also see if I can get my shades down. All right, um, Mark, do you wanna grab the screen back and show again how to use the code? Sure. I see a couple of requests in the chat. Yep. Okay, I'm going to, I'm assuming it's the share code that people are referencing. So remember earlier, it's right up here in the right. Um, and you can just paste your code right in there and then click go. And this takes you to that screen that, or that page that Jenny had built for us. Um, here's down the lower right-hand side is there's the, the 10 frames that she mentioned earlier. If I click on that, it brings it on my workspace. I can drag it up. And then now when I select it, Jenny referenced this earlier, I can click this little icon here and I can flip it around. That's what Jenny was referring to earlier. And then if I want to delete it, I can just delete. And then this here, you can see I can, you can take those counters out or snap them back in. Or if you want to take them from what we call the toolkit over here, you can bring those out and drag them out to this this workspace. So I'm hoping that's the, that answers the question that we were yeah. seeing. And um, on that slide, I did red and yellow. Um, so you can see that when they move it over, you can see what got moved over. When I'm um, using uh, smart boards in classrooms, sometimes the yellow doesn't show up very well. That's why the ones you see that I have on my slides are all red. Um, so, you know, you can decide how you, um, whether you want to color code them um, or keep them all the same color.
All right. Well, again, feel free to continue to tinker as you're listening. Uh, I'm going to move on and um, continue with uh, building this idea of make making a 10. So beyond the uh, 10 frames, we could use the Reck and Reck. Now, I, uh, of course, pair this with using a uh, real Reck and Reck um, in, um, in classrooms. I love them for this strategy because you can see how you move one back and you move the other in. Um, and also for pretend to 10, you can see the 10 in some more like you see here. And then you, um, if you're doing nine in some more, you're removing one bead. So it's a really nice way to develop um, both of those two uh, strategies that are both based on 10. So here I'm pairing them up again. Here's 10 in some more. Students, so I can do it as a quick look or they can just look at it um, either way. And then the next one they're gonna see is this one. Um, if I have them hard copy, I'll even hold them up side by side and have them notice how they're the same and how they're different so that they're starting to see this relationship of 10 and some more um, as compared to nine and some more or eight and some more. So the Rec and Rec is another great tool. And then finally, the number line. The number line here gives a chance for students to really start thinking about how numbers are relational to each other on a number line. So I'm going to send you back one more time. Um, we won't be going back this many times after this. There's three quick ones, so you get a taste. And then we're going to see how to grow, how to use these uh, particular um, tools uh, as we grow strategies. So, but for this one, I'd like you to use this code and uh, show um, using whichever choice you have on the left side how nine plus six is the same as ten plus five. All right, I'm gonna jump back in. Um, I Whether you've been able to build these or not, um, you can see the potential that they have to illustrate the strategies, to show um, how they work, why they work, to really build that number sense behind the strategies. One thing I've learned in my work is that these visuals and story situations, which we're just, which we do, but I'm not working on tonight, um, are so critical to the student's flexibility and realizing if they move one over, it's the same total and things like that. But oftentimes then when they see just an equation, they forget that they have access to these visuals in their heads. And so they go back to just their counting strategies and we're trying to move them from counting to reasoning. So one thing that um, I have found very effective is to before they start practicing using the strategy that they that we do and imagine. So tonight you have used 10 frames, you've maybe used a record rack and you maybe used a number line. At least you've seen them. So um, in your mind, select one of these that you will use to do a mental image to solve these problems. You ready? Obviously you're not entering anything in the chat because you're just using your mental image.
And then when I do these with students, after they see like nine plus four, I'm like, did you use a mental image to, to think, you know, to work on it? Did you think of it as, you know, and so then they can explain, I was picturing a 10 frame. I pictured moving one over 10 plus three. That's how I thought about it. And they can share that. Then they're really, uh, then they're ready to continue to develop this make 10 strategy and they need a lot of practice. So one of my favorite ways to practice is playing games. It's enjoyable practice. There's a lot of language use. It's low stress. And, um, you know, in the a very short amount of time, a lot of practice is happening. So I'm just going to highlight um, one of my favorites and it's called trios. If you have my little purple book, then it's in there under times five, but any game can be adapted to multiple, uh, in multiple ways. So this is me adapting the trios that's in the book for times five to nine plus, because I want to work just on the make 10 strategy. So I've created a game board with all the possible answers if you're adding nine to a single digit number. And then I've kind of mocked up how this might play out. So at the beginning, um, students have a deck of cards and they have two colors of counters. They're trying to get three in a row, a trio. And every time they get a trio, they score a point. If they get four in a row, that's two trios side by side overlapping. So that's two points. That's the game. So it starts like this. Player one turns over a seven with a card or rolls a dice and gets a seven. It doesn't matter. And so they say aloud, like I give them, um, you know, sentence frames. They'll say nine plus seven is the same as 10 plus six or something like that, 16. So that they're thinking through and saying aloud the strategy as they think about it. So they uh, choose to put it on the 16, as you see mocked up here, although they could have picked any 16 they want. The second, the blue player turns over an eight and says eight plus nine plus eight is the same as 10 plus seven, that's 17. And um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. We have a companion website. Thanks for typing it in there because I have it on a slide that you just made it easy for everyone. Thank you. Um, and so there goes. So that's their first roll. And you can see the blue player decided to uh, put their counter right next to the red person as a defensive move. They could have picked a different 17 if they wanted to. Then they draw cards again. The red player, um, you know, talks through their strategy, places their counter. And so it goes. And then on the third round, um, red gets a, a zero. So then they don't need the strategy. They just say nine plus zero. That's nine. I know that answer. So they mark the nine on their game board and the uh, blue player gets a one and they say nine plus one is 10. I know that fact. They don't have to talk through the strategy. They get a trio and the game continues um, until the game board is full or until time is up. So very fun game. Um, and um, that is a way to just practice the strategy. As I said, students must first learn to use the strategy before they learn uh, and then have opportunities to choose the strategy. So then another game that they could play to um, where they might run into a make 10 opportunity is another favorite of mine is lucky 13 and you can see here's the website that has the the companion website that has the games ready to download um, and so in this game the students turn over four cards or five cards um, and they get to pick the two that get as close to 13 as possible and from that they can talk through their strategy or it might just be that they have a 10 and a two and they're like, that's 12. I know that fact. So they talk through the strategy, um, recognizing that sometimes the make 10 strategy is needed and sometimes it's not needed so that they get practice in choosing a strategy. So I've just summarized weeks of instruction to make sure they get make 10 down. This isn't one day, this isn't two days. They see these visuals, they do this over time, they play these games, they get to come back to these games um, over time and they become really good at thinking about how to use their 10 as a benchmark to add. And then they're ready to grow that strategy. So here is my uh, growing the strategy. Um, so you can see here we have the nine plus six equals 10 plus five, 15, and how that strategy grows into whole um, two digit numbers. It's a beautiful strategy for two digit numbers. It works for most of the problems we're adding. There's an opportunity to use the make 10 strategy or to, sorry, make tens. 
And of course, we also have many opportunities when we're adding three digit numbers to make a hundred. Of course, there's, it's not as often that that happens um, for reasons that I, that probably are obvious, but um, there are opportunities. So again, it comes back to learning to use the strategy and then noticing when that strategy really fits the numbers and the problem. That's the real fluency. All right. So we're back to our branding camp opportunities. Here we see how we can grow it. So they're familiar with the frames. I turn them sideways, they fit better. But if I'm doing images and moving them over to my PowerPoint slide, I could do them vertical or sideways, depending on how I would like to, you know, format them. But here we see 49 plus 39. And right away, students eyes goes to the uh, C, their tens. So they can Count, uh, they can see their tens, four tens and three tens, seven tens, and then they can move one over to get yet another 10 and then see that there's going to be eight in their other other frame. So it's just a way, again, we're, we're growing the visuals and we're growing the strategies so that they see that connection and make that connection. You can also do this with um, the um, Rec and Rec. Um, especially if you have two real ones that you can have side by side, that works nice. But I just have sort of that middle row moved over out of the way to show um, how it could be used. And then you can also do it with um, number lines. So this is what you might look like what you had done when you were showing that nine plus six is the same as 10 plus five. Here we're seeing that 49 plus 39 can be 40, basically 50 plus 38 by you know counting that one, you know moving that one pulling that one off of 39. So with these visuals and they see how make tens works, this makes it accessible. You have multiple representations here. They've had experience across them. Some of them, uh, some students will like one more than another, but they, all, but they have had an opportunity to try each and then they're ready to move into experiences, thinking about make tens without the visuals. So um, these are activities that are in one of the companion books to um, this fluency book that uh, Mark mentioned when he introduced me has companions. So this is out of the companion book on adding and subtracting. Um, but it's a simple idea. You don't need the book. <laughs> you don't need the book for this idea. It's just the same and different. You know, this is higher level thinking to be able to notice how something is the same and how is it different. So are you ready to engage in the chat? You got your fingers ready on your keyboard. We're going to start with you choose which one you want. And the first thing you're going to answer is the two expressions are alike because you're going to finish that sentence. So you can do the two digit or the three digit version. Enter something in the chat. How are they alike? Okay, Aretha has kicked us off. They're both adding, beautiful. Yeah, um, I don't know about you all, but <laughs> there's great ideas in the chat. There's a lot of things about these numbers that are alike. And, and what, an important thing is they have the same answer, right? All right. And then secondly, oh, they're close together. I love that. All right. So many things to notice. Some of them turn out to be relevant to solving it. And some of them are just noticings that, um, you, that you don't need to solve it. How are they different? So I see um, Latoya um, said uh, one of them is easier to add. So that's drawing an inference. It's not just how they're different, but something about one that's so important to thinking about fluency.
Yeah, it's easier. And so in these noticings that we notice that they have the same sum, that's an alikeness, and we notice that they're different, one of them is easier to add, then that helps us start thinking about, oh, so we can actually manipulate these numbers. Yeah, I love it. i really amazed at all the um, ideas in the chat. So another way we can help students really think about this strategy is posing work examples. Um, there's been quite a bit of um, attention to work examples, some interesting research, but in looking at worked examples, it increases students' flexibility. Um, several, a number of studies have been done on this. So this is a very um, straightforward worked example. Um, there's three kinds of worked examples, at least. <laughs> so just to be clear, um, there's correct worked examples. That's this category. There's partially worked examples. You start using a strategy and then the students are asked to finish it. And then there's incorrect worked examples. When you're trying to bring forth a strategy that's less familiar to students that you want them to consider, understand, then a correct worked example is a good fit for that. So again, you can see here two that are alike but different. Um, and uh, you have a chance to look at Shanice's work. And the questions that we ask are, what did Shanice do? Why does it work? And then really critical is, is this a good method for this problem? And this series of questions um, can be used with all kinds of things. And I see in the chat, somebody said this can be problematic with subtraction. Mm -hmm. And so what you can do with subtraction is even it gives a, because subtraction is a little trickier, it's even more important to do work examples to show, for example, in this, well, I don't want to get confused. I don't want to start talking about subtraction when an addition problem is up here, but um, I've done work examples showing common difference. And um, it's a powerful conversation because when students see that they can like add two to both numbers and get the same answer and they don't have to regroup, they're like so excited and they're like, does this always work? And I'm like, you tell me, does this always work? And so we start setting up some other problems and do common difference. And that's how they come to embrace that strategy because they've seen how it works. And then of course we ask, why does it work? So um, work examples are great for subtraction as well. Um, and I saw also in the chat, somebody mentioned, would you rather? And that's another great routine or strategy here is you have two correct problems again. And would you rather add this or would you rather ask that? It's beautiful. Thank you for sharing. And then um, sometimes um, it's nice to do fluency work that doesn't involve a focus on an answer. It just focuses on the big idea. So another thing, a routine you can do with students um, with make tens is say it as make 10. So how would you restate this as a make tens? And you can put that in the chat. How would you think about this as a make tens? If you use the make tens, what would be your new problem? So I'm saying some 20s plus 37s. Anybody going the other way? Nobody's moving over to, oh, here we go. Wendy moved it over, moved some over to make the 40. Like on purpose, I put it so you could move them one way or the other. It doesn't really matter. Yeah. Oh, and actually uh, using the commutative property. Love it. Okay, how about this one? 48 plus 25. I, I think I saw in the chat somebody doing a 50 plus 25, and I'm thinking there's a nice opportunity there to connect back to the uh, pretend to 10, right? You're pretending it's 50, and then you're going to come back to. Yeah, I love that. And then finally, 56 plus 27. So students start to see they can move them one way, they can move, you know, you can move some ones one way, you can move some ones the other way. This very activity could be done with three digit numbers to make 100. 
Um, so it is a versatile routine. When I do routines like this, if I'm working on two digit numbers, I usually will start with a single digit, then move into two digits. Or um, if I'm working with three digits, I'll start with two digits. And then that's my, like I scaffold it up to the, to the larger digits. And then time for practice. So this is a super simple game. Um, you put counters on the, um, on the spaces, wherever you wanna put them. And then you roll a dice. So if you roll a four, then that makes 40 with 36. So they can remove a counter from 36. And the first person to remove 36, uh, their, all their counters wins the game. So this is an opportunity to make sure. So one thing I've noticed in working with students, especially when they've come back from COVID, is while they know six and four make 10, they don't necessarily know that 36 plus four make 40. So this game sets them up for success with trying to find those benchmarks. And then just as easily as this game, you can do make 80, make 100, make whatever. It's a very you know, easy, easily adaptable game. So um, Carrie's asking the group about number talks. Yes. Number talks is great for flexibility. There's the sort of very specific protocol for number talks. And then there's the also people will talk about number talks as just a way to do a, a warm up. So if I go back to, for example, um, say it is a make 10, that is a number talk in the general sense of a number talk because you're talking about how else could you say this. Um, but it's not the specific routine. A number talk tends to focus on different, uh, you know, elicit different strategies for the different problems. And this routine is specifically giving students experience to become really adept at using Make 10. So it's, it's purposefully more um, zoomed in on a specific strategy. Right. That's right. And so that goes back to the teaching them to use a strategy and then coming back and having them choose a strategy. What happens is um, if we jump too quickly to choosing strategies, then um, some students don't have a very big repertoire and then they aren't successful They're, and they have they don't have access to real fluency. So what we want to do is make sure students, every student has access to um, the strategies that they're adept at using them. And then we mix that in with uh, choosing strategies. So for example, you could do um, routines that mix between uh, today, we're going to do this strategy that helps us that's focused on make tens. And then another day, you're going to go back to a, tr a number talk that's focused on choosing them. And they're looking for, you know, you're looking as an assessor and they're looking as the doer for opportunities where the make tens is a good idea. So you toggle between use and choose, use and choose. All right. Well, going back to our tree here, Make tens continues to grow. We did making 10, we did make tens, and then we get to our fractions and decimals and we can make a whole. So that takes us back to um, Braining Camp and we can use the various uh, fraction tools that they have and they have a number of them. So right here, you can see from this visual that they can, um, Students can just move one of those fourths over and make a hole. Um, I find that while we have some flexibility with whole numbers, in general, we lack a lot of flexibility when it, as soon as we move into decimals or fractions, we um, forget about uh, the fact that we could um, move some over from one number to another. Uh, to another. And so this could be, if the students have it in writing, they could re-record it as four plus two and two fourths or four plus two and one half, um, and it's easy to manipulate. And that would be true with other visuals, including, you know, the number line. Um, and then, of course, you're not going to use the rec and rec, but then there's the other fraction tools. So you find a tool that matches. Um, go back a slide, please. Here we go. <laughs> So the make a whole strategy um, for decimals is here we have three and nine tenths, so close to four, I can just move a 10th over and then I have four uh, holes and then I have two and seven tenths. 
or here we have uh, nine and seven tenths is three tenths away from a whole number. So I move three tenths over to make a whole. Uh, sorry, I rushed through that slide. Then the same thing with fractions, where we can move some over to make a whole. In my experience with students, fourth, fifth, sixth grade students, make a, make a whole is like a big win. They're like, you mean I don't have to uh, regroup? I don't have to, you know, do all. Yeah, this is a good strat. You know, if you can make a whole, go for it, and just working on that flexibility. All right, so we have the visuals. Uh, we're not going to go back <laughs> to practicing them because we don't have the time. And then we come back to these routines. So now instead of say it as uh, make tens, we can do say it as make whole. So I'm switching over to decimals, but hey, look, they're the exact same numbers because all I did was the same slide, but slid the decimal in. So it, it's a different age student. It's the same activity. And oh, hey, back again is make it, take it. But now it's make four. So if you, you roll the dice and you roll a three, you think of it as three tenths, three and seven tenths and three tenths is make a whole. So very versatile. And then we um, talked about on the number line, oh, by the way, let's not stop with fractions and decimals. We don't have time today to move into um, negative numbers, rational numbers, but here we go with um, the making 10 becomes make tens, make hundreds, make a whole, and let's not forget make a zero. So we can break this apart and um, use make zero, which is a really wonderful strategy for helping students think about um, integer addition. So I wanna come back to where we started today. Um, we started with these two subtraction problems, and we thought about them as um, take apart, uh, sorry, um, take away and as um, find the difference. And that is why subtraction actually is tougher to work with. We have harder time with flexibility and fluency because we have both um, difference and take away to think about. So we need to return to our visuals. So I just wanna um, fly through a couple more visuals um, that help us. So if we're gonna do quick looks and we want to help students with this idea of difference, then we can use two of the uh, things side by side and just ask which has more, how many more? If we wanna work on takeaway, then we show a single slide and we say, you know, what would it look like to take three from the slide? So a little story um, as I'm sharing these slides, I did this very activity in a class that was about grade one or grade two with um, a classroom full of students in a school for um, where all of them had dyslexia. And I thought this was very ambitious, but I wanted them to know that they can think about a problem as takeaway or they can think about it as find the difference. So we did the very images you're seeing here except I didn't have the braining camp bottom line, but the exact same images. And they did the take three, it was my warm up. It took about five minutes. And then we did this activity. I used the number line from braining camp and just pulled some icons off of, um, you know, word and I cut them out. So they're underneath a document camera and I'm moving them along this thing I printed out from braining camp. How far apart, how far apart, how far apart. And then I, um, with the students, I asked them, um, when we were done, I gave them just um, two problems, 11 minus nine and 11 minus three. And I said, which kind of thinking would you use, would you like to use? Would you like to do takeaway or would you like to find the difference? And they talked about it with their partner and they made a decision. And then they played this game, subtraction stacks. And it's just like the make 40 game, make it, take it, where you put counters on the um, thing and then you roll the two dice, you find the difference and you remove it. And these children were saying, they'd roll like a nine and a two and they'd say seven, I use takeaway. Or they'd roll a six and a five and they'd say one, I found the difference. And it was amazing that they were choosing between these two ways of thinking. Um, and they had access to, again, the visuals, they had the number lines and they had the counters as their tools for thinking. And it was um, great to see that already they're thinking about 
what way they want to use for subtraction. And if they do that with basic facts, then when they get to problems like this, they notice that the first problem really lends to take away and the second problem really lends to find the difference. And that is how we help students become fluent. We use visuals, we use stories, and we help them compare different opportunities, different numbers, so that they have many, many, many opportunities to learn to use strategies and then also learn to choose them. So thank you for joining me tonight. Um, I hope uh, these uh, ideas from uh, Brainy Camp and the games and things from my work are um, will support your work towards fluency. <laughs>